the Western Balkans have emerged from the terrible wars of the late 1990s. Today, they all clearly belong to the expanding vision of the European project. But tensions have been on the rise among all these nations. So it's necessary to focus on the role of Europe and how to bring peace and stability to Eastern Europe. Welcome to the panel, Western Balkans in the EU Context. Good morning. Every day we are starting earlier and earlier. First day we started at 10 o'clock, second day 9.30. Now we are starting at, eight at 9 o'clock. Uh, it's good that we are coming to the end because probably tomorrow we will start about 6 or 7 o'clock and it will be kind of very uh, complex. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to have such a distinguished panel and to be some kind of host uh, or moderator, however it's called, on an issue that was just announced, not only in the program, but in this video, Western Balkans in the EU context. Just uh, some people were discussing yesterday and tomorrow about why we are talking about Western Balkan and EU context, wanted to get prepared for this session. And uh, we had, uh, not so long time ago, when we were putting together the program in Geneva, in our event that we were having uh, with UN colleagues in Geneva, we were discussing about topics that we would have this year. And of course, when we put the overall topic, the world of today, challenges and hopes, you can imagine that out of 10 panels that we wanted to come to, it was really big competition. What are the, the challenges of today's world? What are the top 10 challenges of today's world? And that's since every year, it became almost tradition that we are focusing ourselves on Western Balkan in a broader context. We decided to talk not about Western Balkan, but to talk about European Union. And then after discussion, very short discussion, we figured out if we want to talk about the future of European Union as a global player, is in the new geopolitical spectrum, we cannot talk about future of Europe, European Union, even if Western Balkan is not part of European Union. So that's the reason why we came to this, uh, today's title of our panel. And uh, without further notice, we discussed a little bit also in preparation of this morning session, how we would structure it. And first I would like my dear friend and my closest neighbor, not only on this panel, but my closest neighbor as come on coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, being hugging, or they are hugging us, Croatia, in a very geographical context. Uh, and that's the reason why my honor and privilege is to ask my dear friend, Kolinda Graber Kitarovic, resident of Croatia, to give us a broader perspective of interaction in between major mainstreams that are related to European future, which is EU and NATO in context of Western Balkans. So set the stage, Kalinda, please. Thank you so much, Slatko. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I hope that um, you're feeling quite awake to follow this very important discussion for the future of the European continent, but I would say for their sake for global stability. Let me, at the outstart, in the context of what you have said, Zlatko, put forward three very important premises. Uh, first of all, the future of the so-called Western Balkans. A lot of you know that I don't like that term, which has become official. I prefer uh, politically neutral geographical term of Southeast Europe because of the connotations of the word Balkans, which I think represent a, represents a bit of a psychological barrier for everyone to honestly be able to accept Balkans as part of their house. But the future of the Western Balkans is in the European Union and NATO for those countries who wish to become uh, member states of NATO. It is um, certainly a prerequisite for the resolution of any outstanding bilateral issues that result from uh, the wars of the 90s, but also from previous times as well. 
and it provides a great blueprint for the necessary democratic, economic, political, and other reforms. Now, the second point is that uh, the incorporation of the countries of the Western Balkans in the European Union does in no way represent, um, as people used to or, or often say, expansion of the European Union or even uh, enlargement of the European Union. In my opinion, it is consolidation of the European Union because this is a natural part of the EU. This isn't Europe's back, uh, backyard or even front yard. This is part, a natural part that will ultimately connect parts of the European Union where this region is currently in between. Third, if the EU wants to become a global player, it necessarily has to incor incorporate these countries and consolidate uh, in the so-called Western Balkans. Now, I remember when in the early 90s, uh, a Belgian foreign minister uh, talked about the EU as an economic giant, uh, as a um, geopolitical uh, dwarf and uh, a military warm. Much has changed in between, but with the most recent, a recent great disruptor, the war in Ukraine, of course, uh, the um, stability and security with the greatest crisis since World War II, the security and stability on the whole of the European uh, continent has become very volatile. And our own neighborhood uh, represents challenges in that sense because we have seen and we are bound to continue to see uh, the influences of Russia and other third powers who uh, are trying to fill in the vacuum that is being created by not uh, enough progress that these countries are making on the way to the European Union. Now what does that mean? That certainly means potential for destabilization and there are issues in our neighborhood from the situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina to the relationship between Serbia and Kosovo uh, to, um, of course, looking to political events such as elections in our neighboring countries. They certainly will be attempts uh, at uh, projecting instability in the Balkans because, quite honestly, uh, if I were in Russia's place today, I would want instability somewhere else, not just on my own borders, for the EU and NATO to focus at least part of their attention in an area that is obviously so important for European security and stability. And what is going on currently in the Balkans right now when it comes to the perception of the people and keeping people on board um, the so-called hearts and minds, winning the hearts and minds of people, for the EU integration is of utmost important because uh, people not only are there to support the reform processes which are necessary in the region, but they are the ones who decide on the country, on, on the future of the countries through elections. And we want governments who are pro-European and who are pro-reform-minded -reform, uh, elected in the neighborhood. When we look at the polling that is being done in the past couple of years, it shows that increasingly the population, um, uh, generally speaking, the population of uh, Croatia's neighboring countries uh, in the Western Balkans think that authoritarian systems are a better way of government in order to provide for security and stability, economic progress, and the resolution of any outstanding uh, issues within any country. However, the polling also shows that the majority of people do see uh, the future of their countries in the European Union uh, and that there are currently no alternatives to that, and this is what we need to keep. As um, a state official and as an international official, I have always supported uh, the accession of our neighboring countries to the EU and uh, to NATO, as I said, for those who want to. As, uh, um, again, this is a prerequisite for lasting peace, stability, and prosperity of the uh, region, and it will provide a common table to sit around and resolve any outstanding issues before they are, 
before they flare up into problems or even potentially clashes and instability. And let us remember that this region has two great potentials. One potential is to do good things, to make progress just within a short period of time. If we look back to the 90s and if we look to look at all, what all of our countries have done ever since to reach uh, peace and stability in the neighborhood in comparison to many other troubled regions in the world, we have made great progress in very little time um, in comparison to the lifespan of a country. But the second potential, unfortunately, is also to descend into turmoil, destabilization and conflict very quickly. And this is what absolutely needs to be prevented, what we must keep in mind at all times, and we must not um, rest on, our, on the laurels of what has been achieved and think that there uh, cannot ever be wars uh, in our neighborhood that were past uh, that. Unfortunately, we have, make those, we have made those mistakes before. Now, what the EU needs to do is certainly pick up the process and give it a lot more substance. The concept of the so-called Europeanization, which is um, not really making countries European because they already are, but it's the process of adopting or adjusting and implementing all the necessary criteria from the Copenhagen political and economic criteria to the Madrid uh, administrative criteria to the specific criteria of the stabilization and association process that include good neighborly relations, cooperation with the ICTY, resolution of open issues, etc. Uh, that uh, is also the key forward for all of these countries. Ultimately, what they're doing in the context of European accession is creating a better life for everyone in their own countries. But again, there is a good, very good matrix for that. And that is not just harmonization with um, uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of pages of the acquis communautaire that needs to be incorporated in the local administration, uh, local legislation, but it's also about strengthening the democratic processes uh, in, uh, uh, in the countries. And now I will close um, with a question that has been on my mind for quite a while now. If we look at the leadership of the countries who claim that the goal is for them to bring the countries uh, in the fold of the European Union, I sometimes wonder whether those statements are really genuine or whether there is actual work that is put behind that. Because for some, uh, the conditions of transparency and uh, uh, accountability that exist in a country that has uh, adopted these democratic principles, they would not be able to function with that, within that kind of political space. So I believe that one of the way forwards for the Western Balkans is to really give the young um, a chance um, to create new uh, political structures, new leaders, new activists, to give them a chance to be able to participate in the political, economic, and other processes of the countries. Because when you repeat the same old, same old um, uh, solutions uh, that you've had to the crisis and you actually have not solved the crisis, be they ec economic or of any other nature, obviously you're going in, in circles and you have to look forward towards new leadership. So one of the main messages is that we all have to encourage a lot more um, people who are interested in participating in the political and other processes of their countries for the benefit uh, of their own countries and for the benefit of the whole of the European Union. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Kalinda. Uh, Really great overview of uh, setting the stage, I mean, and I'm sure that uh, other panelists will set in that framework and overall framework our panel. And I'm very glad that you started with actually changing the name of our region to Southeastern Europe. It's much better because of a lot of reasons, and I'm glad you did it, because if I would put it that context, uh, 
it would be maybe too, it would be viewed different. But when someone who is coming from non-Western Balkan and who used to be Balkan until not so recently, uh, when you're putting that perspective, we should all be seeing ourselves as South and Eastern Europe, it comes to the conclusion that in the end we are Europe which when you talk about Western Balkan, it looks a little bit far away, especially having in mind when I have Bulgaria seeing them over there, they become Western Europe for us, which is kind of strange, even in geographical sense. Uh, now, having said so, I would like uh, to ask our next panelist, dear friend Jan Fischer, to reflect on this uh, broader context of Southeastern Europe being, uh, let's say, uh, viewed in a context of broader European Union, broader Europe. And uh, also I would like, Jan, having in mind your experience and your professional experience, also to reflect on the uh, issue of having uh, Southeastern Europe called Western Balkan being supported by the European Union in bigger economic integration, not over some daily invented who knows what purposes ideas, but put in a context of the process that we are very uh, enthusiastic about Berlin process and put the life in Berlin process through economic integration of these six countries in between themselves together and having them in European economic community, becoming one economic community before fulfilling those uh, criteria, Copenhagen criteria, in full scale. Because sometimes we have a feeling that European Union is offering us that long dream vision as some kind of destruction from the fact that we are still standing there. And sometimes we have a feeling that we've been left to stay in a waiting room until the end of our life. So I would like you to to put the emphasis on that issue, how we can on a way to better Europe, being integrated slowly and substantially in European, in healthcare, in economy, in Green Deal, and list is not ending with this. So please, Jan. Uh, thank you very much, Lasko. Firstly, I'm very pleased to be here and to share some of my thoughts for me and on the Western Balkan EU in relationships, interactions. Uh, I would like to start with one thought you expressed at the very end of your, of your introduction of my, uh, my intervention here. Uh, that is a lot of years we are sitting in many conferences, forums, uh, seminars, I don't know what, talking about the necessity of the speeding up of enlargement, <coughs> or let's say in, to be in favor of the uh, involvement of Western Balkan countries to the EU uh, environment, EU ecosystem. I don't know what, and time flies. And I would like to uh, attend, join some conference or meeting or forum such as this, with a good feeling that we have the Western Balkan fully integrated in the European Union. That's my what. That's my dream. Anyway, I would like to. I would like to let's say still catch in my in my lifetime. Uh, now, outlining my intervention here, I, uh, let's say, selected three topics or issues I would like to talk to, or I would like to mention. State of art of the European Union, current state of art of, of European Union, uh, then the development, so far development of the interactions between the EU and uh, Western Balkan countries and their perspectives. And finally, I would like to drop some words on the Macron's initiative, which is called uh, Common European Political, uh, Political Community. 
European Union. Uh, when the European Union woke up in the early morning on 24th of February of the last year when Russia invaded very brutally Ukraine and when the EU at that time looked at the mirror it could get a very interesting picture. On one hand and it was time for contemplating and reflecting what has happened, what we neglected, what we did well and what we, where we failed in the European Union. There are a lot of achievements, boost, building up and boosting the strong economic, uh, economic markets, which, uh, let's say, shift the, which allows to the EU to play the role of the global actor, global player on the international stage. Uh, legislation, a lot of, uh, let's say, progress in many areas. That's no reason to go through to the list. On the other hand, there are the things when the EU failed underestimating the threats, geopolitical threats, in spite of a lot of warning reports publicly, uh, publicly, uh, let's say, uh, to, be to be available from the side of the intelligence community, well, Russia, Russian, let's say, appetite to be stronger and to be aggressive. And instead of the proper reaction, namely after, uh, after Crimea in two, uh, 2014, we were in Freival Bay, we were building up the Nord Stream 2, increasing our fatal dependence on uh, Russia, oil, gas, and now let's say we are paying at all. Uh, defense system of Europe, security issues, everything was underestimated, undershot if not neglected. The other problem of the Euro current European Euro Union is the diverging, if not fragmenting. We are living after, in the Europe after, uh, after Brexit. We see the, uh, let's say, drive of the populi populist forces, populist parties, populi populist movements, which are very often even non-systemic, as, as we call it, uh, sometimes there is some feeling for extremism, anyway. So, but on the, on the, on the, on, so, in this case, uh, we are, uh, let's say, just frankly speaking, we are very nervous looking in some countries in their election, what will come to the power, and how will be the attitude of the newly, uh, newly elected government in many, in some countries towards Russia, towards Ukraine, towards European value. Speaking about values, that's one problem anyway I have uh, for a long time. What we did in the European Union that we were talking more about institutions, institutional framework, we achieved the Lisbon tre Treaty, I don't know what, we balance the powers of parliament, uh, council, commission, but what we suppressed was the debate about the values, about the shared values, about the common values, and this is what's making European Union from the very beginning, by the way. On the other hand, not so be so dramatic and so pessimistic. European Union, after invasion, to, uh, to Russia very quickly displayed its resilience, willingness to react, and the European Union actually did it. The waves of sanctions against Russia sometimes are criticized, and I don't know what, if efficient or not, but in the long-term perspective, 
is efficient, is necessary. And of course, that the military support uh, together with NATO, which is, let's say, sent to Ukraine, is extremely important and it's something which, speaking terms of European Union, I am in fact uh, proud of. So this is the picture of the European Union as it is. European Union and the Western, Western Balkan. Uh, that is the lot of initiatives, a lot of documents, a lot of meetings, a lot of seminars, conferences, forums. We have the, uh, let's say, tendencies to integrate Western Balkans the countries in a very positive way anyway, so that's uh, involving them into the uh, European mar uh, market, uh, no question that, uh, for instance, uh, one, uh, one figure which I would like to present here, not to showering you with statistics, which is my profession, but I will do not do it. But if I tell you that uh, more than two-thirds of the over overall uh, trade of Balkan, Western Balkan countries uh, sent, exported or imported, from uh, the European Union, it's two, more than two-thirds of the overall trade of the Western Balkan countries. That's a clear message, anyway. Uh, there were some uh, customs, uh, customs, bar customs barrier, tariff, uh, tariff barriers which were lifted, with some exception, of course, exception of course but it actually, actually works. It makes uh, the European Union are more robust, and of course, that's very positive. It's positive for Western Balkan countries. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of meetings, a lot of conferences, a lot of documents. We have the Western Balkan strategy since 2018. If I'm not, I'm not wrong, uh, we have containing the common defense. Uh, defense, uh, defense and strategic policy, common foreign policy, and so on and so forth. That's good. We have even a lot of uh, scientific articles dedicated to the uh, Western, or the enlargement, to the in more involvement uh, uh, of the B Western Balkan countries into the e European uh, EU, EU ecos ecosystem. So, but we are not at the end of the road. We are, the process on the enlargement hasn't a pace that it should deserve, that which we need, and it would be, could be set in, let's say, in the name of the prosperity of the Western Balkan countries themselves, and in the prosperity and robustness and resilience of the European Union as a, uh, as a, as a whole. So to make a more robust and more efficient, efficiently performing market, to have a good ties to, let's say, stabilizing and consolidating the, uh, the territory or region of the Western Balkan, Western Balkan countries, that's what we need as the European, European Union. Yesterday, Igor Lukšić sent me an excellent, his excellent article with some, uh, let's say, thoughts on the more integration of the Western Balkan countries to the European, to the European Union. Clearly and convincingly depicting on the example of Romania how the accession of Rumini Romania uh, was increasing the prosperity of the country and economic performance of the, uh, of the country and improving also the social situation. And let's say saying where the ba Western Balkans could be if they exceed to the European Union uh, sooner or in time, in time, in time being. So, we are responsible in the EU for, let's say, seeking for the, all the mechanism, and not only mechanism, but to the political willingness 
to speed up the process of the enlargement, not to suppress it, not to suppress it and say, okay, we have other concerns and other troubles. We will have to look uh, at this is geopolitically important issue, geopolitically, not only politically or, terri or locally or territorially. That's the first thing. We have on, ta on the table the initiative raised by uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron, which is called Common European Political Community. He raised it during the French presidency. And I am very glad that the Czech government, when uh, presiding the European Union and the, and the second half of the last year, that the Czech government organized the Prague summit of the 44 heads of state uh, and uh, heads of government of the 44 European countries. This is the initiative which actually could be used to the, as a could be said, efficient vehi vehicle uh, to uh, extend the communication of the EU with others, not only with Western Balkan, but also with Eastern Eastern European, Eastern European countries, neighboring, neighboring, ca neighboring countries, and but that's the first step. There's the initiative. Despite I am usually very pessimistic person, in this case, if you if you allow me, I would say that I see it, let's say, optimistically. Having on mind there is a lot of protesters or crit a lot of criticism anyway. Have, uh, saying that there's some kind of new talking shop anyway, and that is something which is replacing the classical enlargement process. Well, I don't think so anyway. And hopefully it, it wouldn't happen. So let's use the initiative concretely. Uh, let's, uh, they, idea, idea is fantastic. Suggestion, proposals, <coughs> initiative, something. But the, what we call <coughs> operalization of them. This is the most important thing. Projects, funding, and step forward. And of course, the political willingness to go on and to be in a good, in a good drive. So I believe that in my lifetime, I still catch to see at least some Western Balkan countries to sit with us in the European Union and participating on the activities of all the bodies, parliament, council, uh, commission, and I think that this region deserves it and the European Union needs it. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Knowing, knowing that you're in very good shape and health, I mean, I really do hope that you will enjoy being part of the same community with us for a long, long time, your long lifetime, and that you will be coming to our part of the world with no Schengen walls. We're right, using, right. Uh, that's okay, using uh, the same currency and us visiting you without crossing so many borders and also having the same currency, uh, hoping that currency is still going to be Euro, not dollar or yen or well, I don't know what. Uh, so, so I do really hope that we will get closer to each other in sooner period rather than later. And I really wish you good health in every aspect of the meaning. Uh, uh, of course, now we are moving to uh, uh, our dear friend Petr Stoyanov, who is not only coming from Bulgaria, but he is someone who it was always, since I got it in here, this family of NGIC, we're always talking about, and he was one of the most enthusiastic among us to be uh, seeing us in the same same family of European, European family, all of us, because they miss us, obviously. Since they got into Euro, EU, European Union, they somehow went further away from us, and he wants to be us, to be there again, together, not in a waiting room, but in the real, real room where they are already in. Having said so, I think uh, that, uh, I know that, uh, Peter, you're always having interesting ideas about the perspective of security Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure, but I, I just want you to, uh, to ask you humbly if it is possible to tell us, is it possible that in, let's say, when seven, eight years, when we become the same, member of the same structure, are you going to be going back to Balkan or together with overall Europe, 
or we are going to be Europe as well? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Final Leader. Actually, we have been discussing this topic since the very beginning of the Zamik and Zamik International Center, but now we have to put it in a completely different geopolitical context. And in order to be brief, I have prepared some, some remarks, and the title of my statement could be The Western Balkans in the Context of the European Union, a story between two wars. Because the developments in the Western Balkans, including the aspiration of the six countries for EU membership, have been taking place in the period between the two only, the only two wars on the European continent after the Second World War. The war on the territory of former Yugoslavia and today's war on the territory of Ukraine as a result of the aggression of the Russian Federation. In fact, the European integration of the Western Balkan states was put for discussion for the first time just after the end of the war in Yugoslavia and the current war in Ukraine once again triggered the issue of the EU enlargement towards the Western Balkans. After the disintegration of former Yugoslavia, the newly independent states saw their future in the EU not only as a guarantee against new wars, but also as an opportunity for rapid economic recovery, a road to democracy, prosperity and the rule of law. The EU also welcomed the desire of the former Yugoslav republics and Albania, we have to underline that plus Albania to join, seeing it as an opportunity to transform this historically troubled region from the powder keg, as it was known in the past, into an inseparable and peaceful part of the European Union. Moreover, after the accession of Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia and Croatia to the European Union, the six Western Balkan countries found themselves as an enclave surrounded on all sides by new EU neighbors plus Greece. And so, the process which began after the events in former Yugoslavia continued with its highs and occasional lows, but always in a predictable pathway. The candidate countries never gave up their categorical desire for European membership and for its part, Brussels has always and also categorically confirmed its readiness for such membership. This was the situation until the war in Ukraine, which suddenly changed the geopolitical emphasis and the attention of Brussels from the southeast shifted quite logically, by the way, to the northeast. And during his last visit to Brussels, February this year, President Zelensky requested from the European Union to speed up the procedure for Ukraine's EU membership. In her speech, Madame von der Leyen responded, Ukraine is advancing on its European path in an impressive manner, and your track record shows that you are able to deliver fast and with high quality, even as you fight an aggressor, even as you are at war. Frankly speaking, Madame von der Leyen didn't forget to underline that accession is a merits-based process, which means that Ukraine should meet some criteria. What is the news from Brussels? The European Commission is set to release its assessment of Ukraine's progress later this year. Moldova was also approved as an EU candidate together with Ukraine in June last year, and there is a European future for Georgia when the country, of course, fulfills the preliminary criteria. Against the background of what is happening in Ukraine, President Zelensky's call for immediate membership of Ukraine in the European Union is more than logical. The EU also sees the obvious benefits of having a country on its borders that shares European values, of course, provided that Ukraine fulfills the membership criteria. But, what is completely new for the first time in its history, the European Union will be facing such a case to negotiate membership with a country which is at war. Everyone understands that European Union accession negotiations with Ukraine are extremely important because they strongly encourage the country in its struggle for independence 
and territorial integrity. But we must also admit that many questions are raised in this context. And all these recent developments in the northeast of Europe have made both politicians and citizens of the Western Balkan countries even more impatient. And they continue to reiterate even more clearly their aspiration for EU membership. This time they are doing it in a completely changed geopolitical environment and against the backdrop of a new war in Europe. So, I entitled my speech a story of the Western Balkans between two wars exactly because each of these wars has its own strong impact on the European perspective of the six Western Balkan countries. But let's go back to the beginning and recall what exactly happened in the years between the two wars. I remember vividly, 1999, the EU Council established the stabilization and association process, confirming that the Western Balkan seas would be eligible for EU membership if they met, again, if they met the Copenhagen criteria. Additional requirements refer to the rule of law, freedom of expression, civil society, regional cooperation, good neighborly relations. At the EU Western Balkan Summit held in 2003 in Thessaloniki, the European Union reaffirmed that the future of the Western Balkans is within the EU. 2014, the Berlin process was initiated by German federal government and joined by Austria, France, Italy, etc., etc. Also showed once again the support to the Western Balkan countries. There were also talks in Sofia 2018, talks in Zagreb 2020. In June 2022, when the decisions about Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia were taken, EU leaders expressed once again their full and clear commitment to the EU membership perspective of the Western Balkans. What is the most important task that the six countries have to complete today against the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. In my view, this is to make themselves look as one community which is ready to join the European Union rather than as individual countries, each of them striving to meet the accession criteria. This means, first of all, the ability to resolve their previous conflicts in advance, but also their willingness to resolve all future conflicts in accordance with European standards and criteria. I know this is not easy, not at all. But the historical disputes must give way to regional cooperation. And one thing should be clear, after the last Balkan War, it is regional cooperation that proved to be pivotal in advancing the EU agenda for the region in a number of fields, from trade, liberalization, market opening, to police cooperation, and visa liberalization, promoting stability and economic growth. Regional integration among Western Balkan countries would prepare them for a smoother integration with the EU, also reinforcing EU rules in a region characterized by continuous political and economic instability. Unfortunately, in the last decade, the EU integration efforts in the Western Balkans did not produce impressive results and we have to confess that. Moreover, this started to result into feelings of disappointment with the West, both from a political and economic perspective amongst the people in the Western Balkans. The enlargement fatigue has been cited as a reason for slowing down the enlargement process. I remember vividly that after Croatia joined the European Union, the then President of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker, expressed doubts that the European Union would expand during his mandate. In my opinion, those times are gone in the face of the war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine has shown how vulnerable the European continent can be and have once again put on the agenda and shown how important the political, and not only the technical accession criteria are for the enlargement process. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Peter. Uh, 
Every time when you say something, you make me rethink again some things and start thinking new things again. Sometimes you are so giving me such a much hope, and sometimes you have frightened me with your comparisons. I don't know why, but I mean, when uh, Peter was mentioning this uh, rightful approach of uh, European Union to speed up with EU accession of Ukraine, uh, Moldova, and even talking about Georgia, a little bit different. But I mean, I was very encouraged, like all of us, that European Union, I thought that European Union learned some lessons. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's made me kind of being afraid that maybe our last hope that European Union would do something more and speed up. The only hope at that moment, and I stopped thinking in that way, was that, well, if Russia attacks us, maybe we'll get candidacy status and we'll get membership faster. So maybe we could make some kind of deal with Russians to threaten us more. I mean, and, uh, I'm not going that far to attack because it would be kind of very complicated. If Lavrov couldn't fly to Belgrade because of pla his plane being banned, then I'm sure that it's not possible to expect that soldiers fly over the European Union to us. But having in mind so many things that were happening to us, I wouldn't even be surprised that you uh, sometimes uh, let it do it. So, yes, Peter, you wanted to say something, or can I move to... You just mentioned our last hope. I would like to say that our last hope is in the face of the what is happening in, in Ukraine, European Union to accelerate, to change completely its approach towards the EU at large, because this is a completely new phenomenon we are facing today, the war in Ukraine. Definitely, definitely, I agree. Sorry for interrupting. No, no, you, no, Mr. no, no. Chairman. You made this a little bit more interesting, even to myself, and I, and I hope we woke up some people in this room uh, after such a long night. Uh, so I, I do strongly agree with you, and I strongly welcome your, your, your calls to your own European Union members, family that you are, that this is not technical question only, and it is more geopolitical and geostrategic and security issue than ever before since the fall of Berlin Wall. So in that respect, we really do share the thoughts, and I think it's very good that we send that message that we should... Uh, finally learn the lessons that we should speed up the process, not only talking about the future. When I hear the word, you, you have, uh, we are offering you a European future. It actually looks like they are making jokes with us because opening us, uh, offering us future, it's, it's, it may be comforting, but it is becoming more, let's say, uh, sending best messages. We don't know future. We don't want future. We will have future even without you guys, without European Union. We'll have future. The only problem that if you don't speed up, that's our message from Western Balkan sometimes, if you don't speed up integrating overall European space, including Western Balkan and going beyond as a community of values and the same institutions and the same structures, you will, are going to become like us. You will get a Covidization or Balkanization of your own process, of your own states of the European Union. So uh, it is important, it is important for us, but we cannot get in a worse situation than we were during this uh, end of 20th century and Milosevic, Milosevic attempts to actually destroy the country or take as much as he can, regardless of the price of it. And of course, Hague is full of the people and was full of the people who were committed ultimately as war criminals because of that policy. So it is very important that you speed up because of yourself. That's the message from Western Balkan to people in Europe. And I'm so helped, and I know I'm preaching to a choir. I know that in here we have really advocates, President Konstantinescu, Peter Jan, and of course Kolinda. I mean, as our advocates in Europe, members of our safe family like we are, that you want to be with us, that we are not some, someone from Provence, uh, some poor, uh, poor relative that you just like to see on the distance. So anyway, President uh, Konstantinescu, Emil, the floor is yours, and I won't tell you what, uh, what I'm expecting of you from you because you always surprise us positively, so please. In my, thank you, Legumija. In my brief intervention, um, I would like to insist upon an idea that I uh, find highly important uh, now in light of the war in Ukraine and its uh, regional and uh, global uh, implications. Uh, the falsifying 
of recent history by Putin present in all his speeches would um, uh, not have been possible um, had the real history of the fall of communist dictatorship of Eastern Europe and uh, uh, especially of the Balkans um, been uh, uh, correctly uh, presented. The um, uh, peaceful exchange uh, of dictatorship uh, with democratic regimes occurred under the uh, leadership of uh, uh, distinguished men from Eastern Europe, uh, bearing um, a democratic vision, who um, had a strong influence of the peoples of uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. It was later accompanied by the understanding of the visionary uh, leaders of the West who uh, supported a generous project of European uh, integration of the former communist countries. Uh, a part uh, of this uh, leader um, that I use uh, to know are no uh, longer uh, with us. Another part are right here in this conference. And um, this is very, in this very panel. And I believe uh, that it's our uh, duty to introduce uh, the experience uh, we lived. Um, there is a, a difference in the manner in which the historical uh, phenomena have uh, been described throughout uh, time, depending on the interest of each society. Maybe in the most uh, eloquent uh, example is the manner in which the Balkans uh, have been uh, uh, presented. Uh, history is not merely an expression of uh, figures and events, but also the story of uh, each uh, human being is the uh, intersection between uh, history uh, and uh, biography. Uh, in time, I understood the difference um, between um, uh, history learned as a succession of events, uh, history uh, understood as a connection of events, uh, history lived as a personal experience, and uh, the manner in which this experience belongs to some personalities who by their decision can influence the evolution of, or the involution of nation or a state, along with the manner in which this influence can become a lesson for other uh, generations. Uh, the greatest uh, conflict uh, that marked uh, the 1990s was uh, that of Bosnia-Herzegovina. And we have uh, today the change of having among us uh, Zlatko Lagovija, uh, Mladen Ivanic, uh, who were president of Bosnia-Herzegovina, just we have uh, uh, Boris Tadic, uh, uh, the former president of uh, Democratic President of Serbia, who all of the reform initiated by the first uh, uh, prime minister, um, uh, Gingic, Zoran Gingic. Uh, also, we have uh, now first democratic president of Croatia, Stipe uh, Mesic, Josip Yusupovic, uh, until Kolinda Gravar Kitarovic. Uh, also, is here we ask uh, uh, Filip Vujanovic, uh, I remember uh, Milo Djukanovic, president of uh, uh, Montenegro, and Ivanov, uh, President Ivanov of Macedonia. I only have one remark on the title of the panel. There will be no democratic, stable, prosperous, and safe Europe until the integration of the Western, Western Balkans. And for the integration of the Western Balkans, in the uh, European Union. A key uh, element is uh, solidarity. Um, it would be a good idea to uh, collect uh, all the opinion of the Western Balkan uh, countries on the issue in a book as uh, a start for the long-term uh, debate. 
such a book uh, could be accomplished by the Nizami uh, Ganjabi uh, International uh, Center. Thank you, Emil, and uh, of course, uh, you know, I used to be the most interesting person from the region, not because of myself, but because I was coming from complicated country, Bosnia and Herzegovina. We were always interesting, most interesting case, because every mess that is happening, it goes in the end through our sink to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, uh, it, sometimes it's not that bad, because when we flourish in the region, we gain the most. So that's the reason we are so interested in regional, regional dynamics. But I mean, lately Montenegro is taking leadership in being interesting uh, in Western Balkan. Uh, so, so I would like Milica you to give us the flavor of most interesting part of this moment of Western Balkan because of overall dynamics that is happening in Montenegro. You are so far away from us because you are in NATO. I mean, from us in Bosnia and Herzegovina, you are in NATO. You started your, you have your uh, negotiating chapters and so on. But at the same time, uh, there are some moves uh, that are pushing Montenegro go in wrong direction, go backwards. And sometimes I have a feeling that you are taking lead from us as being most complicated and vulnerable part of the region. I hope I'm wrong and I'm sure that having in mind uh, the overall political spectrum in Montenegro, that this is just a uh, temporary and uh, not permanent hiccup that you are going through, that you will again lead us. And uh, especially we are very eager in Bosnia and Herzegovina to see you speeding up in the right direction. And if you are, if we are getting squeezed and hugged by Croatia and speeding up Montenegro, I'm sure that Serbia will learn lessons as well. So let's hear a view from Montenegro at this moment about Montenegro being such a small part of Europe and such a small part of hope of European Union, but such important part of overall dynamics in Western Balkan and in European security and uh, Europe of values context that we hope that we will be witnessing more. So Milice, please. Well, Vlatko, it wasn't a very nice introduction, but uh, I appreciate it very much because, uh, first of all, I do believe that uh, uh, we need to talk, especially on forum like this, where there is so many experienced, distinguished participants, that we should um, put this political correctness aside. There is too much political correctness on the, in public narrative and uh, there is no solution for our real problems. So probably what is happening in Western Balkans and uh, specifically in Montenegro these days is um, part a result of such an approach where we are very much um, eager to just embellish everything in talking about um, achievements, about the goals, but not really looking deeper into the problems. And I do believe that NGIC as a forum as a such here in the panel and outside the panel in uh, discussions and exchanges among us could be very instrumental and helpful in providing what we do need. And we do need specific advices. We do need real solutions in order to get where we are hoping to be. So you all know, I'm quite sure, because you've been discussing that previous years, despite this little break due to COVID and pandemic, that Montenegro was at the forefront of the European integrations when this region of Western Balkans or our part of Southeastern Europe is concerned. We did manage to do a lot of very good and progressive things. I will remind all of you that Montenegro was a country that succeeded in the 90s to avoid all the conflicts that were around our borders. It didn't come as it, on its own. It did came and come as a result of our great efforts to avoid what might be another Bosnia and Herzegovina at the time, because Montenegro is a mix of different people feeling differently 
uh, in ethic ethical way, feeling differently and being uh, belonging to different religions, uh, being divided, of course, politically. But even at that, uh, we all believe the worst time in history uh, of our region, we managed to overcome all the challenges regarding all these differences among ourselves. And we were united in uh, the ultimate goal we were having at that time, which was maintaining stability and peace in Montenegro. Unfortunately, at this very moment, Montenegro could be taken as an example of an extremely polarized society. Part of the reason is the fact that we are leaving transition of power and government after a long period of almost 30 years of different, I would say, combination of coalitions where we did have a dominant party which uh, exercised the power. But the problem is not the transition itself. The problem is that this transition has been encouraged and helped from those who are not willing well to the region or Montenegro or even broader. It's not anymore about Montenegro or the region of Western Balkans. It's about wider alliances. It's about geopolitics. It's about the relations with the big powers, not only in Europe. So from that point, of course, the um, invasion of Russia to Ukraine is something which is having very strong reflections in Montenegro. Maybe not the ones we fear at the very beginning, but still very, very uh, visible reflections where actually uh, all tools of the hybrid war you can think about are applied at this very moment in Montenegro, especially as we are approaching uh, presidential elections in um, two weeks or less, two weeks. We are having everything which you could be imagining as the tools of information warfare. So very much adapted to 21st century. It's not what we used to have in the past at the time of Cold War and what we called Russian propaganda. No, now it's much more sophisticated. So we are having all kinds of disinformation, fake news, even cyber attacks. I will always also remind you that um, end of August last year, we did have a massive cyber attack, not only on government, but on all networks in Montenegro, websites, and databases, still recovering. It's more than six months now. It was so sophisticated and so well done. Of course, we did have all kinds of support from our partners, and in all what we are living these days and months, and already we are in a third year now or more, uh, that uh, support we are having from our partners is invaluable. And that is where it comes so evident to everyone, so to ones who even did have some doubts in the past why Montenegro membership in NATO was so crucial and so important. Without that, it's a small country, that's true, small country, beautiful country, but small country means limited resources. Challenges and threats are not limited. They are the same as for the big country. So in making the right response to them, we do need to be a part of large alliances. From the point of security, it's NATO, and I believe that it's working. It's working because if we haven't been in NATO all this time, who knows what we will, would be talking about today. On the other side, of course, when it comes to European integration, I am so sorry to inform all of you that from the country which was the leader in the process, we are now somewhere on the verge of complete blockade of our path towards European Union from Brussels and from the member states because they are also worried what is happening in Montenegro, what is with the support to European values at the uh, first place. There is no, no at all dynamics in uh, what the reform process were. Everything is just stopped. For how long we will be uh, seeing that very soon, but what we do need there is again Mm, a kind of a much uh, better presence of European Union and member states, of course, in the region and in Montenegro. 
quite frankly, of course, we've got to say that uh, European Union stepped forward at the time of COVID, that um, uh, support to our health systems all over the region, economic support was substantial. But mind you, the perception of our population is not actually of that kind to recognize what have happened in these months and in these couple of years. So still, you are having that kind of inclination towards some uh, kind of um, state orders where more authoritarian uh, regime is uh, present and you are having very strange perception uh, shown in different polls. For example, the other day I just saw that in Montenegro, it's still around 80% of population who are very much supporting uh, our efforts towards becoming European Union member. But on the other side, you are having something like 41, 42% of population who do think that all bad things and all deviative phenomena are coming from that European Union and the West, which means that we are having a problem with really recognizing what and accepting those uh, European values, or I would say values which are linked with liberal democracy, with free market, with uh, human rights and freedoms. And why is that happening? Because that kind of influence we are having from third parties, from Russia at the first place and their proxies in the region and in Montenegro are so present and powerful that we do need to show with specific concrete actions further on what we are talking about and why we are advocating for the um, region and for Montenegro specifically to be a part of that uh, larger family. We do know, of course, that it's a two-way process and no one is asking for any shortcuts. It's quite clear. So for two-way process to be effective, we do need our partners to remind whoever in power is that uh, there is no alternative to what has to be done to, in the societies like ours. And they've got to encourage those who are really believing in these values to help them put it forward and explain it better. I would say that when it comes to those explanations specifically or generally to public communication on a things like we did have at the time of pandemic that we haven't proved to be very much experienced. There is something missing there. So from that point, I also believe there is a room to think strategically and to see how this communication should be led further on. Putting forward, of course, everything which is related, not only with that general story about the values and the democracy and human rights, but about the everyday life. Because we've got to be aware that uh, all our citizens are very worried. They are living in that period of great uncertainties due to pandemic we had, due to very high inflation, due to fear of all the recession, loss of jobs and everything. So we've got to show how we could go forward with overcoming all these kind of challenges, which are not only these geostrategical issues we are putting forward. So there we do need to be together. And um, instead of those, I would say, ad hoc defensive measures and actions have a kind of consolidated approach and have a kind of uh, real strategy when it comes to dealing with our region and every, uh, every single critical point there. Uh, I do believe that um, the general message, you belong to European Union, is not sufficient anymore. It's not sufficient, of course, from the point of European Union members because they're also having uh, certain challenges uh, with their citizens. So we've got to be present more. We've got to demonstrate why the region and every single country in the region is bringing some added values to the Union. That is how we were working when we were enlarging NATO. So when it comes to European Union, I do believe that every single country 
in the region of Western Balkans, of Southeastern Europe, is having these capacities to bring something new and to further consolidate the Union. So being with you means that you wouldn't be having uh, situations where you are constantly thinking about the problems in the region, we would be solving that together. Thank you. Thank you, Milce. We wrap up the uh, opening remarks of the distinguished panel. And I see here uh, in this, from this uh, floor, I see here we could have quick exchange, like in hockey, five new people walk in on this stage and you wouldn't see a big difference. I mean, maybe we would have a higher panel on a, on a stage because I see so many people from the region or, I mean, when I talk region, <laughs> I'm using Colinda's wording, from Europe and Southeastern Europe. That's the region. Uh, so I see a lot of people from our European brother family region who could be sitting in here and this uh, panel would be maybe even richer. So I'm open for, of course, when I see Hikmet here, I don't know why he reminds me when almost 25 years ago when he was a speaker of Grand Turkish as parliament, speaker of the parliament, that was the year when Turkey granted candidacy status. Uh, and sometimes, I don't know, in between this hope that Ukraine is going to wake up everyone and we will be uh, integrated faster. I always have another poll example of Turkey, how 25 years ago they were granted what we were granted this year, candidacy status. And 25 years later, Hikmet is not in the parliament, no more, and Turkey hasn't moved in that direction so much. So uh, in between those, uh, let's say, different polls, we have to see how we can get to the right one, not to the wrong one, especially because we are saying a lot about uh, impact of Russian, Ukraine, Russian aggression on, on uh, Ukraine. Uh, we hope that, and we are talking this morning before the panel about potential, potential threats of vacuum being created in, the, in southeastern Europe, and that vacuum, when you get created vacuum, some, something fills in very quickly. Just small crack, and vacuum is gone, and some poisoned, poisoned gas walks in. So I think that the potential threat of vacuum is uh, more than evident, and we have to see how we can prevent it. So it's better to see about the best prevention, in this case, is not prevention uh, with uh, giving hope about the future. Its prevention is to do something which was not done on time for Ukraine. So let's do these things now in this part of the region called uh, Southeastern Europe. Anyway, please, uh, do we have the mics in here? Yes, so who is? Uh okay, anyone? I mean, I mean, uh, this panel, we were not so extensive. I mean, who is uh, raising the, oh yes, over there. Yes, please. Good morning and thank you for a very interesting session. Um, just for the sake of uh, an intellectual game, could uh, each and every one of you say, what is your contribution? You criticized Brussels. They are slow, they don't understand. Um, what is your contribution to the system? What is your autocritic? Yes, I, I, <coughs> I will start as a matter of, so from the position of uh, a country who acceded to the European Union so far latest, the youngest member on the 1st of uh, um, July 2013, and uh, one of the few countries who acceded uh, to NATO um, post um, the big enlargement uh, wave from Central Europe, uh, Croatia has been doing a lot in terms of structured and non-structured structured processes in order to assist our neighboring countries. First of all, there is the so-called Brdo Brijuni process, which is complementary to Berlin process. Berlin is a little bit more focused on uh, economic issues and Brdo Brijuni is more political and it's really pushing uh, the idea uh, we, we had been doing that for a number of years uh, 
uh, most notably before Russia's aggression ga against Ukraine, but the process continues and will continue to argue uh, for the political security and other reasons why uh, uh, countries in our neighborhood have to accede to the European Union as soon as possible. Of course, it's a merit. Uh, for when I was president of Croatia, together with my Slovenian uh, colleague and friend, Borut Pahor, at the time, we had regular meetings of that process. And uh, for one of the special meetings, the then Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden, uh, came and stayed with us for an entire day to discuss the issues of NATO accession for those countries who want to, and for EU accession uh, um, for everyone. Uh, also, you know, Milica being here, I think she can also testify of how much effort personally I invested into giving a boost to our neighboring countries. And by the way, she was instrumental in Montenegro's accession to NATO. She did, a, uh, she did great work. A lot of that is done behind the closed doors. She was not only persuasive, but she and her government were very practical in terms of fulfilling the criteria. Because as uh, somebody mentioned uh, uh, or, or quoted Ursula von der Leyen, it is a merit-based ba process. So you have to uh, perform, but also the response of the European Union and NATO has to be appropriate, not constant waiting, but really rewarding uh, what has been done with specific progress on the way to NATO and the European Union. Um, with respect to that merit process, Croatia has provided so much assistance to our neighboring countries from the translations of what I mentioned, the tens and hundreds of thousands uh, of pages of a key communautaire in Croatian that can be shared with most of our neighboring countries as Croatian is rather, uh, calls, or is one of the official languages in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for instance, but also close to uh, most of the uh, languages of the neighboring countries specific technical assistance, advice uh, in the negotiation process. Our teams have been working with the teams of our uh, neighboring countries uh, in um, from everything from responding to the questions from that questionnaire in order to get the candidature status and start negotiations to very specific chapters of negotiations and how to deal with that. And uh, in Brussels, there is constant support. Uh, we always put uh, the issue of the membership of our neighboring countries uh, on the agenda. In every single international fora, I have spoken about that. And as a matter of fact, I think it was here in Baku last year, uh, um, approximately at the time when Ukraine and Moldova were granted candidature status. I very much welcome that. I said that I was overjoyed, but at the same time that I was completely disappointed that, for instance, Bosnia and Herzegovina at the time was not great, granted candidature status as well, which uh, fortunately uh, did receive later. But uh, again, that being a merit process, I believe that the country has made um, enough progress in order to, certainly in what Ukraine has done so far. And second, it's a very strong political message uh, to the countries in question and to anybody else who might want to interfere with internal processes, with elections, and with uh, the freedom of choice of these countries to be able to choose their own political future and their own alliances. So a strong message to uh, countries themselves, to the people of the countries, yes, that the goal is there and that they will achieve it, and uh, a message to anybody else not to mess with this area, which has and has to continue to have uh, that clear European, Euro-Atlantic future, which again is absolute, the absolute precondition for lasting peace, stability, and security, but also precondition for the European Union to truly be that global player that it wants to be, not just in economic, but uh, really in uh, the geopolitical domain. Thank you. Thank you, Lou. Uh, do we have more? Great.
Okay. Okay. But very briefly, thank you for the question. I am not aware of the uh, of the using of the word Brussels. I never have done it anyway during my during my talk here, because there is no uh, I don't uh, let's say. Uh, see as the Brussels as the same as the European Union actually is. When I spoke about the European Union, I have in mind the European leaders, European all the structures and not only Brussels anyway, the first thing. The second thing, that's the difference, what you can do as an active politician or someone who is, let's say, doing something which has to be, let's say, effective. And, as, and what you can do as a retired person, as I actually, actually am. The first of all, as I served as the Prime Minister of the Czech Republic and as I served as the, uh, uh, let's say, President of the European Union during the presidency in 2009, I consequently, consistently support this idea of the enlargement to speeding up and it was still before Croatia accede to the European, Euro European Union, using the same wording that I used here. Then it was, it was during my, my, uh, my time in the position of the Prime Minister, Czech Prime Minister. Then I was working for the, Europe uh, for the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development uh, for more than two years. Uh, and as a vice president of this institution, I have in my, uh, in my portfolio the, what we say, the foreign policy of the bank and Balkan region, Western Balkan region was one of my, uh, let's say, region where I was focused very much and very systematically. I've got a lot of ties there with not only the big, big, big wigs, but also with scientists, with universities and so on. At that time, I consistently supported the idea of the speeding up of the enlargement process in this, uh, in this region. What I'm doing now, everything what I'm doing in the public sector, uh, in the public space, and what is, let's say, concerning the Western Balkan on some conferences, on the forums which we have here in Baku, the conferences which was held, I think, twice in uh, Sarajevo, and in uh, other places, I can this consistency support this, uh, this, uh, this idea of speeding up of uh, enlargement, of also urging of the politicians of my country uh, to, to, to do it. The second thing is that I'm very glad that this currently the Czech government belongs to the governments uh, or national authorities. They have the enlargement of the list of uh, uh, priorities, urging others uh, that uh, not to lose it from the focus and to, uh, let's say, keep on, keep on it and to keep on the, uh, let's say, uh, speeding up of the, of the process. Thank you very much. Thank you. You want to proceed, uh, b b Peter? And, and okay. Reflection on this. Answering your questions, I don't think that some of us are blaming the European Union. Uh, bring Mike up here. What, yeah. what I wanted to say, for example, in my short statement was that the European Union is facing a completely, completely different geopolitical situation. Nothing is like during the past, believe me. First of all, no one knows how long the war in Ukraine is going to last. The worst scenario should be, I'm sorry to say that, the so-called Middle East scenario, a war which never ends a lot of agreements will be signed, a lot of things should be done, but people on the both sides of the border continue to live under pressure. And facing such a situation, the European Union should take completely different decisions. That was my point. I don't have uh, the solution what exactly Brussels should do. Just now I realized very well that uh, as an institution, the European Union is a heavy machine. It will take time to rethink what is happening, but something should be done. We can say stop to this routine 
and this is in our common interest. Thank you. For most uh, EU and non-EU states, uh, uh, Europe equals not just an economic space, but also one uh, which uh, reunites people and cultures, which provides uh, means of dialogue and uh, understanding, despite some cultural and uh, civilization aspect. And uh, finally, a way of describing the half a billion of population that display different citizenship, different national histories, and uh, inherent uh, traumas, uh, different languages. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they are all united in diversity, which has been a slogan for the EU for um, a long time. Europe needs to be perceived as being more than just a common market and a free movement area with some uh, limitations. The war in Ukraine has uh, pointed out that Europe began uh, taking a common denominator stand in uh, critical issues. And uh, this could not have been possible without the inner resort that had been uh, put in place by a common market and were then extended to other fields. Now, Europe attempts to stand uh, on is to fit uh, in terms of security, energy, resources, education, health care, and many more. These very attempts are um, the example of uh, Europe uh, widening its area of interest and uh, its uh, means of making uh, a difference. Thank you, Emil Milce. Would you take uh, a floor from, about what... From what our perspective, so uh, we countries which are not yet part of the family, we should be doing what in Montenegro we did until three years. So implementing sometimes even painful reforms, gathering all resources together, which uh, brings us at the time, at the point to have uh, in the negotiation process as it was designed before this new methodology, uh, to have all chapters open, to have three chapters closed, and to be recognized as a front runner. Of course, now we are having changed the uh, uh, circumstances, but still I do believe that uh, European Union recognized what we all stress today, that now it's not only technical matter or bureaucratic matter or just a matter of uh, uh, effective reforms, it's also geopolitical and geostrategical matter. So from that point, uh, somehow it seems that uh, that was realized and uh, the result was uh, uh, imagine how long, for example, Kosovo was waiting for visa liberalization, how long North Macedonia and Albania were waiting for candidate status. Now they've got it. It's a positive outcome. So let's hope that this momentum is going to hold on and that uh, uh, this momentum will be applied now in this new uh, methodology of uh, negotiation and that political elites in the every country would be pushed towards really working on what is an agenda. Thank you, Milce. Uh, if I can uh, say a few words in uh, wrapping up this question that is summarizing so many issues inside. Uh, I think it's... Uh, First of all, it's an excellent question. Uh, what did you do about it, us? I think first we have to define who is you. Uh, you is us. Our uh, title of our panel could be Europe in context. Because Western Balkan in the EU context is actually Europe co in context. So. There is no you or you. There is no you or you. Europe, Western Balkan European Union, we are us. So you cannot say what did you do, but what we all did because it's us. And we have to understand that there is no you in Europe, but us. And Western Balkan is not separate thing from European Union. As far as it is, 
we all have a problem. And you and us. What I want to say is very clearly is, and I'll give you a precise perspective of the guinea pig that is participating in this experiment. The guinea pig is six of us. We are guinea pigs right now. But we went through so many processes that we almost got the science, the brain of the scientist. So sometimes we have a feeling that we are not the only guinea pigs, that you are also guinea pigs. You are who are in the rest of the European Union, together with us. What I want to say is very clearly is, I'll give you a very precise example. Macedonia, or North Macedonia, one of us from the Western Balkan did everything, everything that was asked from them, small, tiny country as a portion of Southeastern Europe. They did everything that was asked for. They even changed the name of the country. Who out of you would be ready to change the name of the country to get some place? Who? And us in Western Balkan, everything is all about symbolism. We were in a bloody wars because of symbols. So can you imagine that some of us changed the name of your own country in order to get in to bigger family which we belong to? Now, what happened to that one of us who changed the name on the request of the big Massa in Brussels, Massa Bob? What did European Union respond to? European Union did not grant to North Macedonia or Macedonia, they did not give them the date of the beginning of the negotiations for the opening the process of getting into the EU. Can you imagine? They were not given a date, date that will come anyway. They were not getting into European Union because they fulfilled the issues, including changing their names. Now, one-sixth of the GDP of the globe is produced today in the European Union. One-sixth. About $16.6 .6 trillion. All of us, not us in Europe, but us in Western Balkan, all of us are less than 0.1% of GDP of that big Masabob GDP, um, Brussels GDP, European Union GDP. We are less than 0.1% of GDP of that big pie. So someone is saying, well, there is not enough. What is, do you have economic capacity to do the job? Of course you do. But then the question remains, I won't go that far to say, like, I have some friends, very distinguished friends of the European Union, all leaders of, real leaders of Europe, European Union, who were questioning, does the European Union have a moral capacity to do the job? I won't go that far. But does the European Union have a political and institutional capacity to do the job? That's the question. And that question remains unanswered, because there's obviously not so what we did is, I gave you an example of Northern Macedonia, and conclude with this. Uh, you see, it's, uh, when Dayton Peace Accord was fulfilled, and uh, we stopped the war, I saw how many imperfections in that peace accord was. And then one day I was debating against the Dayton Peace Accord internally, and I said one sentence. But Dayton Peace Accord brought us nothing but the peace. And then I said, Zlatko, stop it, stop it. We got peace. Peace, that's what we got by Dayton Peace Accord. But that's what we got. And I was comforting myself by saying, peace is not everything, quoting one wise big man. Peace is not everything, but without peace, nothing is possible. So that's what we achieved. But now we can go further. Of course, we have peace in Europe. Questionable, but we have peace in Europe, technically speaking. Besides Ukraine and besides threat that there will be spilled over to the Western Balkan. Now, peace is not everything, but without peace nothing is possible. I agree. But also we can say that sustainable development is not everything. But without sustainable development of overall region, 
nothing is possible. Security is not everything, but security, without security, nothing is possible. So we need development, we need security, not only peace, because sooner or later peace will implode if there is no development and no security. And that's where is the role of all of us. Us in the region do not go into madnesses of 90s, 1990s, but European Union to learn the lessons as well. I'm sorry that today we, had, we have no American perspective in here because uh, uh, American perspective is very important one and shows very clearly that uh, America is, the United States of America is maybe still the most important European country, at least when it comes to Western Balkan. When it comes to Western Balkan, unfortunately, that is the case. So maybe that's the reason, the fact that Americans have to walk in Western Balkan because European Union is not enough. Of course we are not enough. But it looks like there's more of us that have to be together. So thank you very much. And there is a big signal in here, you don't see it. It's a red light. It says time is up. Time is up is telling me that this session is, time is up for this session. But I think that the time is up for all of us, us, in the European Union and Western Balkan. And time is up for Europe to wake up and to continue with the job in new geopolitical circumstances that my dear friends and colleagues were talking about so wisely about. So I'm very happy that I was able to just wrap up their thoughts and I was nothing yet but the loudspeaker of the people who I was probably sitting here with. Thank you so much and the time is up.